Immediately here next to me is the novelist Rodrigo Fuentes, who is the author of the story collection Trucha Panza Arriba, translated into English as Trout Belly Up, which was shortlisted for the 2018 Premio Hispanico de Cuento Gabriel García Márquez and awarded the Premio Cartaluna Centroamericano de Cuento. His most recent book is nonfiction no the nonfiction novel Mapa de Otros Mundos, and he lives between Providence and Guatemala. Um, right next to Rodrigo is David Unger, who is also the, the translator. Um, we'll talk a, a bit about that at this book. Um, David is a Guatemalan-born novelist and translator who received Guatemala's Miguel Ángel Asturias Literature Prize in 2014 for Lifetime Achievement. Among his books are The Mastermind, which has been translated into nine languages, and The Price of Escape. This year, Penguin Classics published this translation of Mr. President to glowing reviews. And then we have Vivian Arimani. Did I say your last name right? Thank you, Arimani. Viviana Mari is a Guatemalan poet, translator, and scholar. Her poetry has been published in Guatemala by Fundación Yaxis. As an academic, Vivian recently completed a master's theory, theory thesis on queerness and symbolism of nature in the poetry of Gabriela Mistral. Vivian currently lives in New York and is completing a PhD in Latin American Studies at Columbia University. So this um, novel, Mr. President, is a really uh, foundational text in Latin American literature and was a tremendous sort of cornerstone in what later became the more famous boom um, of Gar Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Mario Vargas Llosa, um, Carlos Fuentes, several other authors in there, and the famous magical realism, um, which people called, um, of that movement. But this book in particular tends to be overlooked in that um, account of Latin American literature. And so David's translation is really a reser an opportunity to um, increase understanding and appreciation of what's, a, you know, it, it just a tremendously, it's as if we had forgotten Gertrude Stein and like the fact that she made Hemingway, right? No Gertrude Stein, no Hemingway. So I think that it's fair to say, you know, no Miguel Angel Estudios, probably no Garcia Marquez, as we understood him. So, um, so as we go through, we'll try to skim in some plot points for those of you who haven't um, read the novel. But the, the overarching thing is a, is a study of a dictatorship or authoritarian government in an unnamed country. Um, the authoritarian figure is called Mr. President, and it's there's two... There's a romantic line that goes through it, but a lot of it is about people's efforts to survive under this kind of government and how it invades and affects every part of their life. So my first question I'm going to give to David, and I wanted to say, so we, we often within Latin American circles talk about this novel as being a uh, an inspiration for magical realism, but it's also quite a realist novel. And I was wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about what the realist groundings of the novel are. Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Vivian, Rodrigo, Marcela, uh, Joel Whitney, who sort of organized this uh, panel for the Brooklyn Public Library, and I can't believe we're in a courthouse. Yeah. <laughs> I keep wanting to say, here comes the, the judge, judge yeah. Aaron Judge, maybe, I don't know. Um, anyway, um, Marcela sort of stopped herself. She was going to say the word resurrect at some point, and then she sort of stopped herself. I didn't want to say it was dead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, in, in many ways, um, this, this translation is sort of a kind of resurrection of uh, El Señor Presidente in the English language. Um, and I, I do want to talk about that, but I, I want to go back a little bit and try and address the question that, 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 you, that you asked. Uh, Miguel Ángel Asturias wrote this novel between 1922 and 1932. He had been forced to leave uh, Guatemala during the Estra Estrada Cabrera regime. He was sort of like, um, because of the role of his father, he was sort of being used by this uh, hideous dictator as a kind of uh, as a kind of gopher. 
And, uh, and he didn't want to be a gopher. He went to London and eventually went to, um, to Paris, uh, where he studied, um, of all things, the Mayans. Very, very often, Guatemalans have to go out of their own country in order to rediscover their own roots. And it's not that Miguel Angel Asturias didn't have strong Guatemalan roots. He did. Um, he ended up translating uh, the Popol Vuh um, in, the, in the early 30s. And he was part of, a, of the Parisian world of the, of the 1920s and, and, and 30s. He was friends with Bertolt Brecht. He was friends with James Joyce. Um, he was really involved in, in Dadaism, Surrealism, and all the sort of avant-garde uh, movements. So he finishes this novel in 1932, um, and it's a portrait of the Estrada Cabrera regime. But at that time in Guatemala, uh, the, the, the president is Jorge Ubico, who is um, uh, a kind of Mussolini imitator. Uh, who ruled Guatemala with an uh, iron fist. Uh, he, he's, he's the one who helped turn it into a banana republic, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. exactly. The so-called gave... banana republic is because United Fruit with Ubico in the yeah, so. Right. He, he gave the United Fruit Company all these concessions so that they could have uh, their plantations, so that they could build a, a train from Guatemala City to the port. And also, he uh, drafted a law that said that the indigenous people had no rights uh, to work their own lands, because if they worked their own lands, they were actually unemployed, and so he would re-employ them. So the novel, the novel uh, was finished in 32, but he was afraid to publish it because he thought that Ubico would think of it as a characterization of himself. And, um, Which says something about Ubico's government. Yeah, exactly. It's total a monstrosity. So it wasn't published until 1946 um, in Mexico uh, in an edition uh, supported by and paid for by his mother. And it went nowhere. But finally, in 1948, it was published in uh, Argentina with Losada. And people recognized that this was really a great novel. It was a great novel because it was the first um, portrait of a dictator, it, one of the first dictator novels, and we're familiar with the other ones like uh, Yo el Supremo, La Fiesta del Chivo, The Feast of the Goat, uh, and even... Autumn of the Patriarch. Yeah, Autumn, Autumn of the Patriarch by Garcia Marquez. Um, and the, uh, the translation into English wasn't done until 1962. It was done by Francis Partridge, who was a... a uh, a British uh, translator, um, and the the translation was characterized by lines like, "Oh blimey, here come the coppers," mm -hmm. uh, and that's really not much of a, a Guatemalan uh, <laughs> lingo. And there were many words that um, in that novel that are now part of our our daily language, you know, like tamales and tacos and. Uh, Lufas, pastes, as we call them in Guatemala. So the novel comes out in 1962, but it's a very dated book in terms of what's happening in the United States. It's really, as you mentioned, it's, it's the dawn of the boom. It's the dawn of uh, the publications of novels and short stories by Cortázar, Vargas Llosa, Borges, who is not part of the boom, but prior to the boom. And so it comes out in this, um, in this rather shitty translation. And uh, in 1967, he's, uh, he's bestowed the Nobel Prize in Literature for, for El Señor Presidente and, and other novels, including Leyendas de Guatemala and Hombres de Maíz, eh, Viernes de Dolores, a whole bunch of novels. And, um, he picks a fight with Garcia Marquez. And, and bad move. Yeah. I did. <laughs> very bad move. Yeah, yes. very bad move. And he accuses Garcia Marquez of stealing um, ideas for Cien Años de Soledad from Balzac. For those of you who don't know, Garcia Marquez became, before he became a famous novelist, worked in advertising. And uh, he was very good at marketing, too. So those who turned against him did not usually fare so well. <laughs> 
I actually wrote a, a, an essay about my friendship or non-friendship with Garcia Marquez. Uh -huh. I met him three times in my life. It's we'll called, have another panel about that. Yeah, it's called Ghost, Ghost Riding Gobble. It's uh -huh. kind of interesting. So uh, he picked a fight with the wrong person, um, and then he, he stupidly accepted the ambassadorship to France under um, Julio Cesar Montenegro, right? uh, Guatemalan president that um, was not of the military, but he was sort of um, later on controlled by the military. So his reputation sort of uh, uh, plummeted, even though he won the Nobel Prize. So the, the novel is a depiction of a reality, but it's a reality that goes back uh, more than 120 years. Maybe uh, we could skim a little bit some of the elements of realism like that might have stuck out to a, a, any of us. Um, uh, Vivian, is there is something in particular about the realism that chimes with your understanding of Guatemalan history too? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that in terms of realism, the, the biggest element is the depiction of violence. Yeah. Um, and particularly violence um, against women, against disabled people, um, against queer people, um, and indigenous people as well. And, and Jewish people. And Jewish people and, too. And, and, people of Arabic descent and <laughs> yeah and um, David you you wrote in the in your introduction uh, or your translators note um, that contemporary US or anglophone readers in the 21st century would be um, shocked by the the language that Asturias used to talk about Jewish people and women etc cetera, etc cetera, um, which that definitely shows that it's a patriarchal novel. Um, but um, there, it, it's interesting because it, even though there, there is a certain element of um, diminishing through language these people, um, I, I think Asturias was also very aware of um, the marginalization of minorities dur during this regime. Um, he, there, there's a lot of um, mothers throughout the novel, um, and I, I don't want to say a lot about that um, uh, for those who haven't read it. I, I'm trying mm -hmm. to not spoil. Yeah, there's a couple plot points related to that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, like, for example, one of the most um, shocking depictions of violence is um, against a mother. Um, in a jail. In a jail. Um, in a, yeah, which is probably, do you think that's maybe an accurate, because he worked on human rights committees, right? David, did I cut you off for you about this? Yeah, no, it, 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 it's, a, it's a stunning chapter uh, in the violence against women and the violence against motherhood and the violence against children. Um, and, it, and it's, it's done in a very graphic uh, fashion. I, I, don't, I don't think he would have, you know, he, Miguel Angel Asturias had a great imagination, but I think that was part of the realism that you're Yeah, that these not, are not addressing. really invented scenes. These are not invented scenes. torture or innocent people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, can you tell yeah. us, Rodrigo, what about the realism really stuck out for you as well? No, uh, I just wanted to pick up on something that both of you said, because it's certainly, um, I mean, it's Senor Presidente, right? And uh, the dictator is at the center of the novel, but is also kind of an omnipresent, invisible kind of force that affects all characters, whether he's there or not, uh, or his people are influencing events or not. But in a way, the novel is also like it's laces through society. It's like an X-ray of Guatemalan society mm -hmm. at the beginning of the 20th century. And in fact, you start uh, the book with this scene of these homeless men living outside in front of the National Palace in Guatemala. So even from the get-go, you have this sense of the connection of the most powerful, almost um, you know, unassailable, distant person and the impact that that person will have on all kind of segments of society. And one thing is, I think the question of realism is interesting because on one hand you read it, and, or I read it, and I guess this happens to all of us, and we're like, wow, this is totally Guatemalan. 
but uh, there, the language, the, the colloquial nature of the language, the slang, the humor, and that's, I think, part of the feat of translating this book is how do you translate culture, right? As such a, and it's not only culture that you're translating, but I think it's also a vision of Miguel Angel Asturias particularly in a way in which he interpreted Guatemalan orality and turned it into, into writing, right? So I, I think on one hand, it is an x-ray of society and it does show in very realistic and, and difficult ter uh, ways. It's almost like Balzac or Dickens in that way, the way it goes from like the very low to the very high and the drawing rooms of the rich and the fights of the homeless people and shows how they're all connected in a yeah. very Dickensian sort of way yeah. that can be quite powerful. But the other thing, the thing that this novel is also quite famous for is these kind of more surrealistic mm -hmm. elements that were the part that inspired later. And I was wondering, Vivian, Vivian would you like to... Um, Tell us a little bit about what you thought as a, as a poet of some of the uses of the language and some of these dream sequences and um, these effects that make it not just like a realist political novel. Um, yeah, that, that was actually one, one of the, to me, one of the things that make this such a fascinating uh, work of literature, which is that, um, uh, if, if I were to describe this novel with one word, I would say it's playful. Mm -hmm. It's playful in the, its usage of language. There are several passages where um, Asturias is almost um, switching prose for poetry. Um, there, there's a lot of parts that, that, that read just, just like a poem, basically. Um, and that... Um, that, that it, the, it's a very interesting contrast with um, the, the lyricism of the language and the depiction of violence, um, which I, I think that that connects also with um, some moments of comedic relief that happen. Mm -hmm. um, there, 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 there were a lot of parts where, um, as a reader, you get really frustrated because you're like, this is so overwritten and so like overly lyrical and it, it comes off almost as like melodramatic and um, uh, very, very like 19th, since you were mentioning Dickens, very yeah. like 19th century um, overly lyrical um, prose. But, but then there, there's some like hidden little gems of comedic relief yeah. uh, within the prose, uh, which it was so clever <laughs> of him. And I think that that counterbalances the over lyricism of the prose. Could you maybe give an example for all the people who haven't read the book of like one of the, and if you can't think of one, I have a few, but just of one of the kind of fantastical elements or uses of language that really struck you for its vividness? Yeah, um, there's a chapter, I believe in the second part, the, the novel is um, divided into three parts and I believe it's on the second part, there's a chapter where um, the, the president is witnessing um, a group of people chanting to mm -hmm. him. And there, there's the description of the talking cow. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the talking cow is a um, derogatory um, um, uh, nickname for a person. But, but then the, the, the chapter begins with the description of somebody milking a cow. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, for example, uh, a moment where um, Asturias was very clever in um, the way that he structured mm -hmm. the chapter, where since, because it started with the des description of a cow being milked, when when you when the the character of the talking cow appears, you mm -hmm. you like immediately mm -hmm. think of like a literal cow who's talking, yeah. and and then uh, towards the end of the chapter, the the president goes back inside his room and he starts crying and he's super moved, and <laughs> you know the, the the talking cow. All she does is praise him, right? Like everything yes. in this world is good because you are the president. That's the talk, uh, talking. Cow's and what's what, what's interesting is that you know the the talking cow is one of the toady psychophants that are always around the president, which uh, I think one of the th dimensions of this novel is that it makes you think of Bolsonaro and it certainly makes you think of Trump, and sort of the the psychophants that uh, are you know Kevin McCarthy, 
um, who are constantly, you know, they, they can be stepped on, kicked, bruised, and abused, and they still bounce back for more abuse from Trump. And you see that in this novel, in, you know, of 100 years ago. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... No, no, we're all talking her. here. We're all talking I, here. I, I, yeah, please. I actually wanted to go. pick up on something that you mentioned, Vivian, which is the, the humor, which... As I was reading it this, this last time, I, I, I was just struck by how funny so many moments are. And you usually think, I mean, it's a dictator novel, right? And there's an element, it's kind of a political thriller too. So I agree there's lyrical parts that kind of distance you a little bit from the action, but then it picks up again and it like drags you back into the story. It's a very, a very astute, as you said, narratively, how Asturias moves between different rhythms. Uh, but the humor, it's... Um, it's it's just present in the in the puns in the there's like a slapstick humor that you encounter a lot. Keystone copish, like yeah. Yeah, um, and that's kind of surprising, like the the variety of registers. And since you're mentioning the um, surrealist mm -hmm. influence on the on the book, uh, and that's uh, as David said from from also Asturias years in, in Paris in the twenties. Um, he there's also this uh, myth Mayan myth of Doil. Uh, uh, which is the, the deity for, for the fire and very kind of, uh, kind of connected to human sacrifices. So, so that kind of surrealist drive to go to the kind of foundational myths for the collective unconscious of a society, it's very present in the book as well through his Asturias going to the Mayan myth and kind of connecting that figure of Toil to Señor Presidente, to Mr. President. And he weaves in and out of that in a very, well, clearly elegant but compelling way. And, and that's another feat of the book, I think. And of course, there's a character who is the poet, right? Mm. I mean, what do you think of that character, Vivian? Oh, yeah. Um, he, <laughs> and I, he actually recites poetry. There's songs and poems in it, too. It's very formally innovative in that way. Yeah, yeah. But I, the poet is kind of a problematic figure, right? Yeah, yeah. The, what, what's interesting about the poet is that it, it's an example of a moment where Asturias, as the author, inserts himself into the narrative mm -hmm. in a way, um, because Asturias did publish um, poetry, not, not just fiction. He, um, and I, I think he was more prolific in poetry than um, than prose, um, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, it, when, when you go to bookstores in in Guatemala and you go to the Asturias section, it's like several tomes of poetry wow. by, by Asturias. Um, and um, as, as David had mentioned, Asturias uh, had to leave Guatemala in exile. Um, and the, the, the poet um, also kind of pisses off the precedent in the novel. Right. Uh, and so that, that, that's why I interpreted the, the, the presence of this character as the author inserting himself. Uh -huh. um, and, um, and his like, in, introspection as um, his, his role uh, as a writer, as a poet, as, as a public figure, and as somebody who, um, as, as an intellectual too, is um, defying the, the regime and the dictatorship. Now, you guys are all, I mean, novelists or, or poets and, and I was wondering if we could talk a little bit also I'm going to have a little bit of a passage which I'm going to read a bit let's just give you a feel for one of these surrealist moments there's a, a character who witnesses a murder um, and he's comes home and he's very drunk and he kind of has a bickering thing with his wife and he he's trying to fall asleep and he's looking at his hands and it's sort of a Macbethish moment, and he says, you know, an eye passed over the fingers of his hands like light from a small lamp, from pinky to middle finger, then over the ring finger, then from the ring finger to the index, from the index, an eye, a single, solitary eye. It's the eye of the murdered man that's haunting him. And he develops this actually quite wildly um, into like a scene where like the eye dominates the entire room and you can like kind of imagine like a dolly painting of this big eye um, over it. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you guys all do this kind of work. As a writer, why do you think that he's going there? He could have written just a kind of very realist political novel with all the elements of it, but he does then go into these places where he has like, I mean, I pull out many passages like this where connected to the plot, not just randomly, he'll go off on this 
kind of wild, imaginative thing that takes right. you to different I, place. I, I think the, the, the element that you're referring to is, is sort of like the surreal element. Mm -hmm. And, and by surreal, it's, it's, it's based on reality. It's an extension of reality. It's connected to the dream and to the imagination. And the I is, uh, by, by the character, um, I think it's Lucio Vasquez who sees the I? No, it's ah, um, Rodas, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Whose wife is, is the enough. one who ends up in right. prison later, yeah. Um, you know, he, he feels guilty. He feels guilty for having witnessed a, a killing uh, from a guy who he was trying to get a job from. And, and so he's not able to, in any way, uh, remove that eye that's, that's following him. So I think his use of uh, surrealism is, is never really gratuitous. I think it's really related to what's happening in, in the novel. And I think that that's the aspect of surrealism that was you know, somewhat influential in the work of, of Garcia Marquez, mm -hmm. is how, how can you use fantastical elements to tell you more about life and the imagination and guilt and humanity than actual straight um, realistic uh, occurrences. Just to add something to that, um, yeah, the, 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 the it, let's say passages of stream of consciousness in the book are, are really strong and, and you can feel a poet writing prose more, more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I think in this idea of the, the overall seeing eye, it's also a novel about a dictatorship that kind of colonizes every single corner of existence. And even the dreams are kind of up for that, uh, being kind of taken over by the fear and the guilt. Uh, so you, I think it's a very kind of porous relationship between reality and dreams throughout the book, right? Mm -hmm. And it reflects this constant paranoia, too. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons why we're talking about this um, book here at the Brooklyn Book Festival is because the Brooklyn Public Library is, um, has a series called Second Reads, which is about re-looking at classics that have been forgotten. And this is actually the inaugural event for that. So I, the next question I want to ask, and um, for all of you, but I, particularly to Rodrigo to begin with, is you know, he's, you have like a giant of literature here, and like most people in the United States have never heard of his work and don't understand what a big role it has played. And I'm wondering, you know, as a writer, how does that does that, maybe it doesn't, have any effect on, on you when either you sit down to write or when you talk to people about your, your work or your national literature or even when you go out on the market to try to sell a book? You know, if you could say, I'm Colombian, and I come out of the tradition of Garcia Marquez, everybody, everybody knows what that means. You know, it's like, so, and I, obviously we all read beyond our national borders. I don't mean to be reductive in that way, but I wonder if you have any thoughts of what it means to have such an important thing sort of forgotten from the canon? I, I, feel, um, I feel even for myself reading Miguel Angel Asturias, that experience has changed throughout uh, the, the different attempts I've, you know, I've made and different books. So I think it's also a writer that changes a lot depending when, when you, you, you read him, is my impression, at least personally. But then in terms of the Garcia Marquez for Colombia or the Pablo Neruda for Chile, on one hand, that is kind of a guiding star and, and you feel kind of accompanied by these great writers. On the other hand, it's a big shadow to have over you in the way Chilean writers or poets were to an extent writing against Pablo Neruda and uh, Colombian writers have to write against Garcia Marquez. And I've never felt the, like the shadow of Asturias as an oppressive kind of presence, rather, as an inviting, very unique voice in the Guatemalan -like narrative landscape. And when I think about the other narrators in Guatemala, uh, novelists. Um, yeah, I don't know where that sorry. ringing is coming. I think the, the, is it they're too close. close. Yeah. Thank you for your tech intervention. <laughs> Just two, two small details, but like, I, like, let's say Augusto Monterroso, Rodrigo Rey Rosa, Luis de Leon, Miguel Angel Asturias are all such distinct writers. And I don't know how you guys feel, but I don't feel constrained by, by that presence. Um, it, it's interesting that you say that you don't feel constrained by this 
great authors in Guatemala because un unlike Chile or Colombia or Argentina even, um, I, I, I feel like Gu Guatemalan writers and spe especially Miguel Angel Asturias is not as widely read globally as Gabriel Garcia Marquez or Borges. You're saying in Guatemala locally? Or, I mean, just like in general. I mean, sorry, locally here in the United States, globally, locally over globally. there. Globally, globally. Yeah, globally, right. globally, uh, globally, Guatemalan writers yes. are not as read. Yeah. Um, and pe people who know about uh, Latin American literature know the name Miguel Angel Asturias, but, mm -hmm. but it's not, pe people don't read Asturias the way they read Borges or, or the way they read um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez mm -hmm. or Gabriela Mistral, Pablo Neruda, etc. Um, so I, I, I think that that, also makes it in a, in a way easier for Guatemalan writers to um, find their own voice mm -hmm. and to be seen as like their own independent person. Like I, I mean, I I don't know about the, the two of you, but like I, I I'm sure that um, if, if you meet a, a random person in the street and you say that that you're a Polish novelist, they they don't and that you're a Guatemalan published novelist, they don't immediately go, oh, so you probably take inspiration from Asturias. <laughs> you, you know, like that, I'm sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> because chances are they don't know who Asturias is. Okay. Or they, they, they don't know who any other Guatemalan novelist is. You know, it doesn't happen. <laughs> David, do you feel more of that shadow because you were you were living with this translation very close to the text for like four years, right? So you have a very intimate relationship with this book. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I published five novels before I did this translation, mm -hmm. so, um, and and my work in the same way, I, I, Vivian, I don't really know your, your poetry, um, but, uh, you know, Rodrigo is not a surrealist writer, uh, and neither, neither am I. Um, and, uh, you know, what I would say about, uh, you know, the, El Señor Presidente is, is obligated and required reading in Guatemala when you're in secundaria, like 10th grade. And it's, it's really tough going for, uh, for a 14 or 15 year old to read a book like yeah. this. Uh, I mean, I, I have a friend who's here who, who was asked to review the book and said, you know, I can't review the, bu the book because I just found it uh, so violent and that there's nobody good in the whole fucking book. And, you know, I need to find something to grab onto. And can you imagine a 15 year old, you know, who's he or she or, or they is, is sort of beginning to discover what what they are and you know they come across a book that really is not in Spanish muy amigable mm -hmm. and and so what I tried to do in the translation is to come up with a with a version that was amigable was friendly friendly to the reader so each translator translates for for his or her or their own generation and and I felt the you know the translation came out 60 years ago and um, it's, a, it's a brilliant book. Gerald Martin has a, a, an amazing introduction where he, he says, he's so spot on. He says, you know, the greatest writer or the greatest novel of the, of the 20th century is El Señor Presidente from Latin America. I mean, he says it. He said it's not 100 years of solid. You know, they may be, they may, they may be more complete novels and more... Um, essential novels, but uh, I don't think Vargas Llosa, Isabel Allende, uh, Elena Poniatowska even would have been able to write the books that they wrote that they wrote without this book. It, it all started here. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah. And oh, and can't... it's you know each chapter. There are forty-two chapters. They're short chapters, mm -hmm. and they're titled chapters. It's it's a book that uh, really invites the reader. I mean, we've talked about all the sort of heavy and sad and uh, difficult aspects of it, um, but it's really a novel that really invites you in. I think we just have a couple minutes left. I want to see if there are any questions out in the audience. Um, let's start over there. You were fast. Um, you first. Uh, I mean, I wanted to, so when I ordered this book, I wanted to teach it in Pakistan, my school. And I remember having to write to this, 
they somehow were publishing, had, had the rights to this. And they sent that copy, it took a long time. But the reality, I mean, outside of the US, people who are living here, and they spoke to that reality. Yeah, I mean, Waveland tried to block my publication, so. I think one of the great things about this um, translation is n not only is it an exquisitely done and like really a pleasure to read, but that um, introduction that David was referring to um, is in this edition, so it really helps set the whole political context for this book to understand where that came from, too. Um, but yes, it's like it just as a practical matter to just be able to hop on Amazon and order it now is just wonderful. You had a question, too? Oh, sorry, did I skip your question? My question was, uh, I would say that Asturias was actively written out of American huh. sort of. mm -hmm. And when you see the review that comes out for the Greek book, I believe, in the New York Times, they roundly kind of dismiss it. Mm -hmm. Shabasa himself says, this is one of my worst translations. But because the, the banana trilogy speaks to the critique of American capitalism, perhaps there's mm -hmm. a of politics, it also gets Lenin Prize. I mean, he did get the Nobel Prize, but I think in a popular way, he maybe. My yes. Is, sorry for the long thing, but uh, are you planning to translate other books? No. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm 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 of age, and there are younger people, and and you know, I welcome younger people to to tackle some of his uh, work. I, I I have problems with the Banana Trilogy. But I do, I do know that what Americans read in this country are Gregory Robas's translations, and he, he, he sort of hurried through it. I mean, he did really not, he did not respect the, the original text. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that you brought that up, because when, when, when I was um, thinking of the question of why, why has this book been forgotten for so long, the first thing I thought was, well, it's inconvenient mm -hmm. to the US. It's highly inconvenient. Um, uh, mainstream um, U.S. literary markets are are obsessed with Gar uh, Garcia Marquez because he, they perceive his writing as so exotic and uh, it's, it, you, you know, it's like very innocent in, in a way. I, I, even though he, <laughs> Garcia Marquez also like did some political writing in, in a way, but but yeah, a hundred years of solitude has. A some political element that but do people but, but overlook it, because they don't realize that banana company but, and is it's really not American, it's not as yeah. explicit in the yeah. way that Mr. yeah this President, is much more and and, yeah. and, and so it's it, it's not com convenient for the US in general to yeah. to to be advertising this book yeah. at all did you want to chime in too should I just go to the next question yes yeah, we can go to the next question. okay yeah. I, I know you had a, your hand up before yes yeah I yeah. So I'm a Russian Ukrainian writer, and that's my book. It's now translated into English. So I, my son was taken away by regime, like because it's like in Russia, and I ran away with no money, nothing to New York. I just said Moscow to New York plane. I didn't speak English, and this book is very famous in Russia. And I think I read the book, and I feel it's the new time comes. So we feel it's like very scary to live in our reality right now in Russia and Ukraine. I have both sides, so I can uh -huh. paint with both sides, I feel. And I, one question, why it's ended up so cruel and bad, and second question, because I have... You mean why is the ending so cruel and so bad? So cruel, yeah, it's I kind of, uh, as a person, like our people looking at the answers right now, mm. and I feel that the book is on time, but I feel that I don't want them to read it because it's, it's like a noir movie, right? It doesn't like you know, the way a noir movie never yeah, really has a happy ending. You want yeah. to have hope at the end of the tunnel, yeah. and uh, that's kind of what do you think? Why it's ended up, and where is the hope for people who are really living right right now? I think like it's a modern novel for many countries, and especially our countries. And second question is the foreign writer. So my book is about just small person, usual woman who try to mm. like. <laughs> just be still alive in this situation mm -hmm. and what, where I can find the help to publish because I feel this book planted a tree mm -hmm. and I was in Wuhan before, that. I was in 70 countries so I feel that like, like uh, I spoke with Elizabeth Gilbert, I'm going to see the Shale Strait so I feel this is a very alive book and it plants a tree, I hope to plant a forest for this cut life that cut it like for many years of this tyrannic regime in the earth and I really hope 
to be a part of ending of the regime. Mm. And as a foreign writer, where I can go, yeah. <laughs> you know, what I mean? because it's published, it's it's rated in English, but I just feel lost because I had a hard story and I want to give the hope. So my hope is planting a tree. Where is the hope of this book for people? Um, well, in terms of publication and publishing marketplace stuff, if you want, we can we can chat a little bit after the panel. But for this, the purposes of this panel, let's try to stick to this text. And um, Rodrigo, since you didn't speak to the last question, do you want to kick off about why the ending of this book is so dark and it gives like very little hope? Yeah, it's. Um... I mean, I think two, two, two things for me are hopeful about the book, if, if we're looking for hope in a, in a book, right? Uh, one of them is the fact that it, someone can write characters and um, address such a horrific situation, because it is horrific, through language, which is also beautiful. And to me, like, find, I don't know if we can find the redemptive quality in poetic language, but to the extent that a book is a book, I think that's what it can offer us. The second more extra literary dimension is that, um, I mean, this book became, was more, much more widely read, like, um, once democracy came to Guatemala, which was the, the democratic spring, 10 years of democracy following the two dictators, one of which had been, you know, this book was based on. So in a way, the book ends in a dark moment, but it gets read in a much more hopeful one. Um, and, and the fact that a place like Guatemala, you know, uh, 15 years after, 20 years after the events being described here or somewhat being described here, would, would allow for such a reading, and would allow for this book to be such a central book of the Guatemalan canon. I think it says something hopeful about, um, you know, even in the most dire situations, literature can still kind of survive and, and add something like maybe productive to the conversation. That's what I would say. But uh, Asturias should be answering this question. David, Vivian, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, I would just say that actually um, there's an epilogue, and the epilogue is not as, um, as, uh, overwhelming as the next to last chapter. Um, and uh, it's, I, I wouldn't say that it's kind of hopeful, but you know, writers write what they need to write. We can't tell writers what to write. And this is the novel that he needed to write, Asturias needed to write at the time that he wrote it. You know? And so um, I, you know, as, as someone who, who believes very strongly, I've written novels with, uh, with um, kind of hideous characters in them. I believe strongly in transformation and there's always hope. But this is the novel that had to be written at the time that it was written and at the time that it was published. And I, I, I can't criticize it for that. And your book is something else. Yeah. Um, I'm debating, I think we have. Does that mean we have five minutes? I think so, so let's have a, one more question, sir. Yes, the, the Nobel Prize has many components that are not strictly literary. So what event facilitated this exchange outcome of the Nobel Prize for students? Hmm. Are you asking why, why? Why he won the Nobel Prize? Yes. I mean, great writers, let's say, Borges, didn't get it. Well, Other not so good, got the Nobel Prize for, for, for non-literary reasons. Well, it's, there, there's a term in, in, in English, you say it's a crapshoot. Yeah. And you, know, you can't it's really logically try and understand why somebody wins the Nobel Prize and why someone else doesn't. Uh, Miguel Angel Asturias was the first Latin American novelist to win the Nobel Prize. Uh, Gabriela Mistral won it, I think, in 1946? Five. 45. And it's not just for a single work, it's for a lifetime of work. Uh, Miguel Angel Asturias has pu published at least uh, 15 novels and uh, at least five or six huge volumes of poetry. So it's really for uh, a lifetime achievement. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So as a translator, Uh, 
Uh, well, as, as I write in the introduction, there were 250 um, uh, parts that I did not fully get. And so I contacted two Guatemalan writer friends who tried to help me figure things out. Um, though this novel was, was written and completed in 1932, it's dealing you know, with, with, with a Spanish uh, that is no longer used anymore. Words have fallen out of, out of usage. So I, I had a difficult time trying to figure out um, what certain terms uh, and, and perhaps inside jokes might mean and puns. And, and some, of, some of these puns were able to be figured out by my friends and some were not. And so, you know, I had to leap over the ravine, otherwise it would sink. I think to close, I'd like you each to just maybe pick one particular scene or moment of dialogue or something in the book that really st stands out in your memory to share with readers to just give them a, flav a stronger flavor of just like exactly what the, the writing is like. I'll, I can begin if, if that will give you time to think since I'm springing this on you, right? There's a scene um, when a woman is released from jail because she has been sold by the person who trumped up her charges to a brothel, mm. and she arrives at the brothel, and she, for reasons that I won't disclose now, she's in a tremendous state of grief, and she's standing like this in the brothel, because she's got something in her arms, and the men are circling around her, because she's the new girl, right? And who's gonna, and, and just that, oh, the darkness of that image, of that scene, that you are so feel her pain, but he's also he's showing you her pain, but he's also showing like these vultures that he's caricaturing. Um, to me, felt like the way that he gets at this kind of tenderness and interior emotions, and also just the darkness of the world that these characters are operating in. So why don't we just go down the line? Do you want to go next? <laughs> Uh, well, I'll try to <laughs> balance it out. <laughs> yeah. uh, there, there's this one little scene, it's very minimal, but uh, one of the angel face, Caradanke, leaves with um, Ca uh, Camila Canales, this, this, the daughter of the general that he's trying to save, and they're very worried going out of the, the house into the street very early in the morning, and they see someone ahead of them, and they realize it's a drunk mailman and the mailman is throwing the letters as he walks down the street in the middle of the street, left and right. And, and that team, the mail. yeah, just throwing it around. And they even stop, I think, to pick them up and put them back in his. And it's those like little moments which I think yeah. make the moments like the, the, the one you mentioned so powerful because then you have these kinds of valleys and, and peaks. And so anyway, that's my little thing. That's great. It's interesting that you mentioned that because Guatemala doesn't have a postal service. <laughs> It hasn't had one for six or seven years. You, you, can't, you can't deliver a letter. It's impossible. I actually like and love chapter 12, which is about Camila, which is, um, it's such a, it introduces uh, the beginning of the film industry mm. and people seeing films for the first time. Uh, she is so uh, kind of beautiful and innocent and, um, uh, I, you know, I think of this novel as much as it's a portrait of a of a, a despot and a dictator. I also think, and we've discussed this, that it's it's really a, a novel of love. Mm -hmm. She sneaks away with her nanny to go to the movies. Right, oh, that's yeah. a chapter, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, Vivian, so um, I, I also love chapter 12 um, because that's, that's a chapter where the, the linear narrative gets interrupted and we, we, we start to get a, a sneak on the past life of Camila um, before things happen um, to her. And uh, I, I also love the, the descriptions of going to the movie theater, and we, which go in hand with the main, one of the main um, imageries, Im imagery of the novel, which is light and seeing. Mm -hmm. the, the, the novel literally starts with uh, a description of light and 
candles and now I had to reread the book and watch for that in the, that theme. <laughs> there's, so it's very there's, perceptive. Yeah, theme. there's I mean there, there's like so many like moments, but I I, I well um, th this was like my second or third uh, time reading this. Well, my first reading it in English, but um, I. There, there, there were several instances where I highlighted um, very random moments where a candle appears yeah. and where, where light in general shows up. And um, th th those were some moments that I really valued. And I think that's all we have time for. Um, can we get a round of applause for this?